There are some other ways to define sequences. We looked at what are called closed forms. So you can see, for example, mn. You just plug in your m value, and that's your nth, uh, or your nth term. So there is another way to define sequences, and that is recursively. So recursively defined sequences. So some initial value or values are given. So for example, we could have uh, a0 equals 1 and a1 equals 1. Actually, I think a0 should be 0. So sometimes it's just the very first term. Sometimes it's the first few terms. And the a n term is defined by previous terms. So you don't know a n in terms of just n. You know how a n relates to terms that came before it. Maybe a n minus 1, a n minus 2, a n minus 3. So in this example, our a n plus 1 will be a n plus a n minus 1. So it'll be the sum of the two terms that came before it. So let's write out, in this example, let's write out the first six terms, maybe the first seven terms. I'll rewrite a0 and a1. So a0 is 0, a1 is 1. a2 is a1 plus a0. So it's the sum of the two previous terms. So that is zero, uh, 1 plus 0, which is 1. So I want you to find a3, a4, a5, and a6. And they're just the sum of the two previous terms. So this is a very special type of recursive sequence. Anybody know the name? Fibonacci. Fibonacci. So this is a Fibonacci sequence right here. <coughs> so you can, a lot of sequences can be written recursively. Uh, there are recursive sequences that either can't be written out explicitly or is very difficult to do so. But we're not going to worry too much about recursive sequences. We're going to go on the uh, closed form or the explicit ones, where you have a function for the nth term. So you don't really need to know about recursive sequences for, uh, for this class. So we're not really going to cover these. They're basically not too easy to do calculus on. So they are useful at some time uh, for some things, but for in calculus class, we're not going to worry about them. So the definitions we are going to use so here's some more properties of sequences bounded from above. So we'll take the sequence a n, and it only makes sense if these are going to infinity. So if it's a finite sequence, you can just look at exactly what the last term is. 
Uh, but these infinite sequences don't have a last term. So if you're bounded from above by m, so what does that mean to be bounded from above? That means your terms, your an terms, are less than or equal to that number for all n values. From wherever you started, whether it was 1 or 0, or even 100, wherever you started, for all your n values, every term is going to be less than m. So that's bounded from, from above, bounded from below, by, we'll use, L. So it's a really similar. Just L is less than or equal to a n for all n. <coughs> so every term is not going to be smaller than L. So L is less than or equal to every single term. And if you just see the word bounded, so if you don't specify above or below, it means bounded on both sides, above and below. So what is monotonic? It is definitely the way I talk, but also when we're talking about sequences, monotonic means the same. Uh, it's either going to be increasing the whole time or decreasing the whole time. So that's what it means. So it's not jumping around bigger number, smaller number, bigger number, smaller number. So it doesn't mean constant. It just means if it's increasing, it's increasing the whole time, decreasing, decreasing the whole time. So there's two types, monotonic increasing and monotonic decreasing. Momo. So writing out the definition, so this means a n uh, plus 1. So if it's increasing, that means the next term is bigger than the previous term. So it probably makes sense to write a n less than or equal to a n plus 1. So if you go one more over, you're going to either be the same or bigger. And decreasing. That plus 1 is to, is adding to the n, not the Correct, n. yeah. And decreasing means if you go one further, you are less than or equal to your term. So the term's getting smaller. <coughs> so now we're going to combine some of these together. So those are our definitions. And now we're going to use these. So what happens if you have a sequence that is, so if an is uh, increasing and bounded from above, So your sequence, your terms keep getting bigger. And also, they don't get bigger than a certain number. What do you think we can conclude about this sequence? So they're increasing, but there's some number that they're not going to increase past. So let's say they're not going to get bigger than 100. But they're also increasing overall. So we think about graphing them out. They're increasing. However, there is some maximum value, no matter how far I go over, that I'm never going to get past this maximum value. Horizontal asymptote. So it's basically a horizontal asymptote. 
And uh, in our language, that means this will converge. So eventually, it will get close to some number. How do I know it will get close to some number? Well, let's say it doesn't get close to some number. So how can you keep writing dots that um, need to be the same height or taller, but also can't pass this horizontal line? Eventually, you're going to either run out of room. You can't go back down and gain some extra space. That would be not increasing anymore. What's that? So yeah, if I keep going, I either stay where I am or I get closer to the line, one of the two. Um, and if I, <coughs> yeah, if you keep going, you're going to eventually settle down to some number. So if you're increasing and bounded from above, then an converges. So increasing, bounded from above, an converges. And we're going to get something very similar. So if is decreasing and bounded from below, <coughs> then we also get convergence. So why do we need that bound? Well, if you take that bound away, then all of a sudden your terms can go as high up as they want. So that's why we need that bound there. Think about uh, sort of like you have a balloon inside, and it's going to only rise, but there's also a ceiling. So it can't rise past the ceiling, even given an infinite amount of time. So that's why the bound is very important. So you can't make a turn like this and keep getting bigger and bigger. So that's the end of sequences. Um, can we clarify one thing? Yeah. Bounded from above and below. Yeah. Can you show us an example of that? Bounded from above and below? Yeah. I can give you a really lame one. Okay. Constant. Is it? Okay. Um, that may not be, that may be not what you're asking about. Okay. Or that may be too simple of an example. It's just on the other two, we had bounded from above by m, a n is less than or equal to m all for all n values. Then we had this similar thing for bounded from below. And then on the third one, we had nothing. So most functions we've looked at, you can't use a function that has a limit of positive or negative infinity as, a, as n approaches infinity. So polynomials are out. Logs are out. Uh, you could use an exponential, but you would need something like uh, a base less than one, a small base, so it didn't uh, get bigger as n got bigger. So any function that has a horizontal asymptote could be used here. Thank you. Uh, you don't want to use one with a vertical asymptote because that, well, kind of depends on how you use it. But you don't want the if it's going to be bounded, you don't want your outputs to get too big or too small. Okay. So this way, they're going to get closer and closer to zero. And I could add like 100 if I wanted to. That just shifts my sequence up 100. So it's still going to be bounded. It'll just be bounded by numbers that are 100 more than the original was bounded by. OK. Um, in this, we're not talking about any uh, trig, like sine, cosine. Sure, I can write a trig uh, sequence. You can do something strange like cosine of n, and this is strange because n is an integer. So you're going to do cosine of 1, cosine of 2, cosine of 3, which are all ugly numbers. They're going to be irrational numbers. However, what is the biggest this could ever be? 1. 1. What's the smallest? 1. Negative 1. Negative 1. So no matter what, we're going to be bounded. Uh, so there's one that is going to act kind of crazy, but really not that crazy because every point is going to be between y value 1 and y value negative 1. So it doesn't have a nice pattern, but I can tell you it's going to be bounded. This is definitely not going to be increasing or decreasing, because it's going to have 
points kind of all over the place. And then can we also be bounded from the right and left if we? Mm, so if you graph these out, what the graph looks like, it goes forever to the right. Okay. So this is your n-axis. And generally, you st there is a some n value that'll be oops, some n value that would be the smallest n value for this sequence. So some n value will be the smallest here. Okay. So it won't go forever to the left. Okay. It'll only go forever to the right. And this is whatever your you could start at a negative value. Let's just call this maybe n zero. So that's your initial n value. And I wasn't writing them down because they don't necessarily have to start at 1. Okay. So that's why I wasn't writing like n equals 1 or n equals 0, because it doesn't matter what value you start at. But they have to start at a point? They have to start at some integer value. Okay. You can't have a sequence going from negative infinity to positive infinity? You can, but you don't want to think about that right now. That's, we don't need to worry about that right now. Okay. Thank you. You can have anything you want, but in calc class, ours are going to start at a some integer and then go to infinity. Thank you. Uh, and if you wanted to go the other way towards negative infinity, you could just have the same sequence and just replace n by negative n. And all of a sudden, when n goes to infinity, this negative n will go towards negative infinity. So in just looking at these sequences, you can also have one that essentially goes towards negative infinity by just changing your n to negative n. So we're going to look at uh, series next. That's our next section. So we'll start out with the definition of a series. So basically, a series is the sum of a sequence. So take some sequence, and if you just erase the commas and write plus, 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 <coughs> you add up all the terms, that's a series. So a sequence is a list of numbers, and a series is those numbers added together. So similar words, but they mean something similar, but definitely not the same. So a series is a sum of a sequence. And of course, we had finite sequence, which will give you a finite sum, infinite sequence, infinite sum. So these can be both uh, finite and infinite. And <clears throat> when you have an infinite series, how in the world can you add up an infinite number of things? The short answer is very carefully. Uh, one way to do it is partial sums. So partial sum is don't add up the entire series, just add up the first n terms. So the first five terms, 10 terms, 400 terms, and that's called a partial sum, where you don't go across the entire uh, sequence or series, you just stop somewhere. And of course, you could have a partial sum for just the first term, the first two terms, the first three terms. And for some of our uh, series, we're going to use partial sums and look at the pattern of how the partial sum has changed. So let's start with the most famous series, a geometric series. Actually, we should start with notation. So 
So before our notation was curly brackets. So we'll start at some small value of n. I'll just call it n naught. It's usually 0 or 1. And then we'll go up to n, big N. And big N can be a big number, or it could be infinity. So this was uh, for a sequence. So the way we would turn the sequence into a series, we use a sigma. And your starting value stays on the bottom. Your ending value stays on the top. And you just write your an right there. So that's the same sequence turned into a series. Now what does this mean? I'm going to start at 0. I don't want to have to write n0, n0 everywhere. That's going to get annoying. So we'll just start these at 0. You don't have to start them at 0, but it'll make our notation look a lot nicer. So this is a0 plus, so we're starting at 0, and then add a1 plus, and keep going until you hit an, uh, except if n is infinity, there is no last term. So that's what it looks like uh, when n, n, when big N is a number. And when big N equals infinity, it's actually easier to write down, harder to compute, but you just don't have a last one. You could think about A infinity, but that's a bad way to think about it because there's no last term. So it doesn't make sense to write down A infinity as your last term because there is no last term. So it'd be, that would be very misleading. All right, that big letter right there is sigma. It's technically a capital sigma. So that is what sigma looks like. It's basically a sideways M, capital M. Well, probably a si uh, capital M is a sideways sigma, historically. Greek alphabet's a little older. So we're going to write down some arithmetic properties. We're going to, of course, be doing algebra and calculus on sequences and series, but we'll start with algebra. What's a plural of series? That looks really bad. Series is? Probably is. It's like mice. Mices. Mice. Mice. All right, so algebra and series doesn't matter about English. Uh, if we add up, and I'm going to not write the uh, endpoints. So if we have some constant times every term, you can write this as constant times the sum of all the terms. <clears throat> now this can seem a little strange, so what I'm going to do over here on the right side is use bad notation, which is a dot, dot, dot with pluses. Now it's bad for writing out, but it's really good for intuition. So all we're doing is noticing there's a c times every term, and we're factoring it out. So that's all that's going on here. So it's factoring. Now this next one requires uh, that you don't have 
an infinite uh, sequence, or I don't have an infinite series. Actually, let's, I'll write a different condition on it. So this is sum a n plus sum b n. Now you have to be a little careful because what if one of these, what if this first one adds up to infinity? And then maybe the second one adds up to negative infinity. Maybe they might cancel, maybe they might not. So we have to be a little careful. So this will work as long as both of these two on the right side are finite, as long as they both uh, converge. So we can split it up as long as they both converge. So every finite uh, series has to converge because you're adding up a finite number of numbers. Okay. So those, you can just ask a computer to, hey, add up the first 100,000 terms. Uh, but w it's only in the infinite case you have to start being careful because that's when you could have uh, the sum going to infinity. So if you add up an infinite number of ones, for example, that's an easy, easy one to see that's going to be infinity. Uh, so if So I'll just do a real fast example here. So if I add up a bunch of these, so first of all, what are we really adding? We're really adding negative 1 together an infinite number of times. What is an infinite number of negative 1's added together? Negative, negative infinity. However, if we try this rule up here, you'll get sum negative 2 plus sum 1, which is negative infinity plus positive infinity. Now, in this case, the negative infinity was a lot stronger. So it would be negative infinity. However, just looking at these two, I can't tell you if it's what value it actually is. Uh, so it turns out in this example, negative infinity was stronger. It was twice as strong, so this one went to negative infinity. But I can't tell you what negative infinity plus positive infinity is without knowing more information. So if this is the information you're given, you can't make any conclusion, basically. If they were both positive infinity, that's a different story. So the most famous series is geometric series. We'll start with that. So this doesn't make sense when r equals 1, because that would be divided by 0 on the right side. So it certainly won't work when r equals 1. Think about what we're adding together. What happens if r is a big number, like 2 or 10? What will we get if we keep adding 2 to bigger and bigger powers? Infinity. Yeah, it's going to go to infinity, and actually relatively quickly compared to just adding 2 by itself, which also would be infinity. So if r is big, this is going to go to infinity, and if r is small, close to 0, then this actually will converge. So this converges when r absolute value is less than 1. So if r is close to 0, this will converge. Does this work if r actually equals 0? So what is a bunch of zeros added together? 0. 0. And then what do we get on the right side? 1. Ah. This actually does work for 0. 
What's the very first term? I think we'd have to take a limit to really show it, but you'd have zero to the zero power, which is more complicated. But if r equals zero, if r equals zero, you can just tell me what this is on the right side. Add up a bunch of zeros. Um, and it better not start at zero. I'll make sure I don't do that to you. So the little red flag is zero to the zero. What in the world is that? So we'll avoid that problem by just saying this works when r is not zero, and then we'll be OK. So that is our geometric series. And this is important. It should go on your cheat sheet. I'll put it in a box. And you want to include the conditions right there as well. So you don't tell me 2 to the n power added up infinite times is 1 over 1 minus 2. So let's start out easy, and then we'll do ones that are more difficult. All right, find the sum. 1 plus a half plus a fourth plus an eighth plus a sixteenth, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what you need to do is figure out what is r, and then use this formula. And hopefully r is less than, uh, absolute value r is less than 1. So this is just 1 half to the n power. And we just use that formula. 1 half is definitely less than 1. This is 1 over 1 minus 1 half. Don't mess up fractions. That's 2 halves minus a half, which is 1 over regular a half, and that is 2. So this sum is 2. So there's at least two ways to do this problem, this next one. You could use the result we got above and just think it's not 2, but it's really close to being 2. So I want you to figure this out in two ways. One way is use the result we did just before. And a different way <coughs> is write it out and think about re-indexing. And how can you re-index? And eventually, I want you to get down to n equals 0 to infinity, 1 half to the n, and you'll have some number outside. So try to do this the way that you see how to do it, and then try to do it. Uh, and You should be able to see that it's this right here, where if you start at 2, you'll have 1 half squared, which is a fourth, and then an eighth, and a sixteenth. So that's definitely the same thing. How can you re-index this to start it at 0? So you can solve this using a, basically addition, or you could solve it using multiplication. It's a good time to ask any questions. So I'm going to try to solve it.
So if you use addition, the additive way to solve this is you just notice the one and the half are missing. So I need to put the one and the half back in. So I also have to undo that. So I have to take out three halves if I'm going to insert the extra three halves. And then we know the sum of these terms was one was two. So it's two plus what I had to use to compensate. So we get one half. So this is what I would call the additive way to do it. And the multiplicative way. <clears throat> so any questions on why this is what we started with? That was, at least for me, the easiest way to write it down. But the problem is I need to start n at 0. So I need to drop n by 2. So one way to do that, so if I'm going to start at 0, so I drop n by 2, I have to compensate and undrop n by 2 or raise n by 2. So it'll look like this. And of course, n plus 2, that's half to the n times half uh, squared, which is a fourth. So that's the extra fourth you would get out here. And that's a fourth times the same exact sum we had the first time, which is 1 half. And that should seem really weird that you can do it one way and the other way, and they both work out to the exact same value. So any questions on going either way? There's, other, there's probably some other ways to do it that I'm not thinking about, but these are the two general <laughs> types of ways you could, uh, you could address this problem. Next problem, alternate signs. And the pattern might be a little bit tricky to see. So this better be a geometric series. Can I multiply by something to move to the next term? It's probably easier to see if you ignore the first term and go with these terms. What do I multiply by to get to the next term? Negative 1 fourth. Negative 1 fourth. So if you know, know you need to multiply by another negative one fourth, negative one fourth, it's going to look like one fourth to the n power. So every time you get another n, you get another multiply by negative one fourth. So let's just naively write down n equals zero to infinity. That's definitely not the right series right there. So when n is zero, we get one. I don't want 1, I want negative 20. So we'll compensate by multiplying by negative 20. So it'll give me the correct uh, 0 term. That's negative 20 times 1, which is 20. Does that give me the correct 1 term? So when n is 1, I get negative 20 times negative 4, which is positive 5. And we'll check 2 to be sure. 1 fourth, negative 1 fourth squared is 1 16th. Negative 20 divided by 1 16th or divided by 16, something, 4, 4's cancel, 5, 4's negative. So that works out for the next one. <coughs> so this works out. <clears throat> the only thing we need to do is use the factoring. So we're going to factor negative 20 outside. So it's negative 20 times negative one-fourth to the n power. And we're going to use geometric uh, series formula here. One over one minus negative one-fourth. You have to be careful with your negative sign and your fraction. So we can reduce this. So I got one plus a fourth, which is five-fourths. And that's four-fifths. Negative something, 16. So I 
Any questions on that sum right there? So why in the world is it negative 16? Let's think about where we started, negative 20. And then we added a smaller number. And then we took away an even smaller number. And then added an even smaller number. So every contribution gets smaller and smaller, basically. So we're not staying at negative 20, but we're not moving too far away from negative 20. So that <coughs> plus 5 puts us at, let's see, negative 15. And then we're going to add. Uh, anyways, you're going to be close to negative 15. And it turns out negative 16 is the value this converges to. So our next example, drop a ball h meters above ground. It rebounds r times h meters. Where R, what do they call us in physics? I want to say something like the, it's not the coefficient of bounciness, but it's something like that. Static elastic collision coefficient. Nobody else took physics? So I can just make up everything? All right. Well, it's just the bounciness. It's how much is going to bounce off the ground. Uh, and. Unless you have some magic bouncy ball, r is going to be a positive number less than 1. This ball is not going to bounce up as high as you dropped it. So if you have a good bouncy ball, maybe it's 90% as high as you dropped it, something like that. So we have a ball bouncing, and it bounces up a little less each time. Now, this is a little unrealistic because it doesn't, it doesn't factor in uh, air resistance. So in a vacuum, the ball would. Uh, it would bounce up as much uh, as the energy it got off the bounce. So I want to know, uh, find the total distance traveled off an infinite number of bounces. And we're assuming that the ball is dropping straight down, that it's not sort of thrown forward and down. So we're just counting vertical distance that it's going to go across. Can we assume that this converges because it hits an uh, object and then just keeps bouncing off the object over and over again, slowly converging to the object? Uh, well, remember, it's going to bounce up less each time. So it's going to go a smaller amount. Yeah, but eventually, it will converge. No, actually, it won't. It will ne this one will never actually stop. Uh, but this is unrealistic because there's friction in the real world, air, air resistance. So eventually the ball is constantly slowing down, basically. But in this problem, in every physics problem we do, you're in a vacuum. So we don't worry about that. So if I draw a graph here of the height, we'll start at h. So here's the first bounce. Goes down. Bounces should be parabolic shaped, or parabola shaped. Now, r is some value less than 1. So let's say this is r times h right there. It'll be 80% or something like that. It's going to bounce back up and then fall back down like that. So it'll bounce up to r times h. So how far does it bounce up on the next bounce? So the yeah, the old height was rh, so it's going to be r times rh, or r squared h. So the next bounce is going to be r squared h. So it'll look something like that. And then after that, it'll be r cubed h. And I'm just going to write dot, dot, dot. So it'll keep going. So you just pick up another power of r every time that you go. So let's write down the distance traveled. So we're not counting any of this horizontal. I just want to know the difference in the verticals here. So 
our first bounce is h. Now the second bounce, when we go in this amount of time, are we going, is it just plus rh? Yeah, you got to go up and you got to go down. So you're really going across this amount twice. So you're going up that amount, down that amount. Plus, now our next bounce right here is similar. It's 2, but this height is r squared. And then 2r cubed h, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So our first term doesn't look like our other terms. So I'm going to separate that out. So we're going to write it as h plus. What can I do to all the remaining terms? So we got our 2, and we also factor our h. So we get that out. So we got 2h. And what we're left with is, oh, we can factor out more than just 2h. What else can we factor out? So we can almost get an r out, but, or an r squared, but we can definitely get an r out. You don't have to do this, but actually, let's pretend like I didn't see it right now. So we got r plus r squared, r cubed, dot, dot, dot. This is almost a geometric series if it started at 1. So I'm going to use algebra to force it to start at 1. So we're going to factor an r out. So if we write it as 2hr times, now it's 1 plus r plus r squared. So we just use some algebra to write it as a geometric series. And then we just write this as summation r to the n, n equals 0 to infinity. And use the formula. So this is starting at 0. You got r to the n. So it's 1 over 1 minus r. And this is the total distance that ball will travel. That's unrealistic because there's no air resistance, so this, this ball will bounce forever. <laughs>